From Santa Rosa, California, this is 19 Stories. I'm Cheryl Holling. To honor and celebrate Black History Month, I'm releasing an encore presentation of my interview with Eric Jackson, who was a true American treasure. Whether you've listened to his story before or are listening for the first time, I think you'll agree with me just how special Eric's contributions to jazz music education, producing, and broadcasting are. It led me to a period, a very brief period, where I, I was sort of flirting with the idea of atheism. It was like, there can't be a God if if all this is being allowed to be happening. And it was John Coltrane's music that touched me and had the power to bring tears to my eyes. And I couldn't describe them as tears of joy or tears of sadness, but I just know I listened to Coltrane. In particular, one of the earliest recordings I listened to was his Love Supreme. And that just reawakened in me this uh, knowledge that, yes, th- there definitely is a God out here. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a we surprise so outbreak. Is the issue of pandemic no social distancing at all? They, they said that they would express their concerns um, about so the mask quickly. supply. Where's the mask? Where's the gloves? A second wave is we all need some all good news. People. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. Eric Jackson has been a fixture on the New England airwaves for almost five decades. He began his radio career at Boston University's WBTU-AM radio, then for several years at NPR's WBUR, Harvard's radio station WHRB, WILD, and WBCN, before landing at NPR's WGBH that has been his on-air home for the past 45 years. In addition to being an award-winning announcer and producer, Eric holds the distinct title of Dean of Boston Jazz Radio. He is currently part-time professor of African American Studies on the faculty in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities at Northeastern University, where he is also a co-host of the Friends of John Coltrane Memorial Concert, which is the world's oldest annual performance tribute to the musical and spiritual legacy of John Coltrane, and is now in its 43rd year. Eric Jackson, welcome to 19 Stories. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And we're going to trust that third time is a charm, given we've been attempting to do this for a while. (laughs) Yes. I did want to just say, first station I started at was WTBU at uh, BU. And that was in 1969. So actually, I've been on the air in Boston for 51 years. Well, we certainly don't want to shortchange you. (laughs) (laughs) We really don't, because that is quite the accomplishment. And actually, let's dive into that, because for being on the air, I, I wrote for almost five decades, which now I know is over five decades. And given how much we know radio changes um, all the time, what do you attribute your longevity to? Because that is quite the accomplishment. First of all, you know, I always very quickly say I've been blessed. I mean, you know, what else can I say? I've been blessed. Right. There's certainly been loads of talented people along the way, but uh, I've been blessed to be able to uh, stay around this long. I also had some ideas about uh, radio and presentation and things like that, which I think might have made me stand out. And part of it was just continuing to stay on the air. There were times when, um, especially in the early days, when uh, I went from making almost no money to making no money. And my idea was, well, if you go off the air, people will forget you. If you stay on the air, then uh, people will remember you. So it's not that big a deal to go from making very little money to making no money uh, when you're 21, 22 years old. So I just decided I was going to stay on the air. And I literally moved from station to station. In some cases, doing my last show on one day at uh, one one station and doing my first show at the other station the next day. Uh, 
because I just felt it was it was great to be a presence. As far as presentation is concerned, too, I also thought that uh, you know people remark how I sound like myself, and thank goodness I do, and that's what I've always tried to be like on the radio. I never wanted to have a radio voice. I, in fact, when I first started off, some of the first shows I did were actually rhythm and blues shows. You know, a lot of rhythm and blues announcers would have these uh, raps that they would, you know, uh, do. And you know, I tried doing that, and I'd break out laughing in the middle of them. It's like, I can't do that, man. I, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> that was, you know, that's ridiculous. You, know? you meant not only sounding like your natural voice, but also sounding like who you are as a person. Right. Yes, yes. And adding to that, you know, especially doing evening radio and, and overnight radio, you're coming into somebody's living room or maybe even their bedroom. Bedroom, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, so that uh, uh, you want to come in and sound warm and friendly. Uh, you don't want to be overbearing or overpowering. Jarring them out or, of their... their... <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that that was something I always thought was very important. And, you know, the guitarist Grant Green, I, I met him in the 70s. And uh, he came to my apartment once and we're sitting there having a talk. At the time, I was working at WILD and WBCN. There was a few months where that those two stations overlapped. Now, WILD was the only uh, black formatted station in the Boston area, commercial station. WILD was mostly geared towards a younger white audience, big rockers. It was a big rocker station. And uh, Grant Green said to me, you know, you have to realize the responsibility you have. You have these two audiences right there. He said, you have to carry yourself in a certain way representing this music. Mm. He didn't, he wasn't really, I didn't get the impression he was talking about carrying, in one sense, carrying myself in a certain way, but I had to represent the music in a certain way. And I've always tried to, when I'm on the air or when I'm in public, remember that I'm the uh, representative of this music and in certain senses of this culture. And um, that that's a, a burden to bear, but it's one I've enjoyed uh, bearing, I guess I'd say. And it's a beautiful piece of advice that he gave you, because I understand that your father, Sam Jackson, uh, also known as Mr. Sam, was the first African-American radio announcer in New England, and that he w would often appear on your show prior to his passing. Right. He he in 1947, I think it was WHMO in Providence. I guess they must have put out an ad looking for a vocalist for their house band. And he went to the station to inquire about that job. And I guess they sat him down and said uh, after they talked to him and said, uh, why don't you have a seat here? We're going to talk it over and we'll let you know. So while he was sitting I guess, in a hallway or something, waiting. Um, these two guys came out, and he didn't know who they were, and they started talking about jazz. And my father got into the conversation, and he, he didn't realize that one of the people that had talked to him was actually standing behind him listening to the conversation. So uh, he walked up and said to my father, do you know anything about jazz? And my father said, well, and this is typical fashion for my father. I know a hell of a lot more than those two do. <laughs> and, and they turned out to be the big guys at the station too. So they hired him as an announcer. That was in 1947. He was only on to about 1950. And then my family left Providence and moved to Camden, New Jersey. That of course was before the time when uh, the masses had tape recorders. You know, there were some tape recorders floating around, but most people didn't own tape recorders. So I never heard his show. My oh. brothers, I had two older brothers, they heard his show, but I had never heard his show. Oh, that's so sad that you don't have that recorded. For right. So uh, when I started at GBH, I started uh, inviting him to come on to the station and whenever he came up from New Jersey to visit. And certainly at first, some of his old listeners 
would call up so excited because they remembered him. They knew who he was, you know. Wonderful. What a beautiful story, too, right, right, how he yeah. got started. And and the Father's Day, too, uh, we did a show either on Father's Day or the closest work day of me working near Father's Day. And I'd get people who would call up in tears sometimes because they would be thinking about their own fathers. I get comments like, you know, it's really great that you could sit for five hours in a room with your father. I don't think I could sit in, in with my father for five hours in a room without fighting. Wow. You know, I mean, I, you'd get all those kinds of comments and people would, there's still people now who say, you know, of all the shows you did, I think those are some of my favorite shows when you sat there with your father. And he, having been in radio and being a jazz lover all his life, he would sit there and just tell these stories that I had never heard before. Well, you know, when you buy Billy Holiday, when you go buy Billy Holiday a drink, you know, you had to buy our Chihuahua <laughs> one too. What? Wait, wait, wait. You know, but yeah, yeah, that's not just a sidebar. Right, okay. right. right. <laughs> right yes. Those are very rich, wonderful stories. And maybe have you ever thought of on future Father's Days, revisit those times that he was on air with you and, and replay them? I, I've definitely thought of it, uh, you know, and unfortunately, in this litigious world we live in today, I'm not sure how easy that is to do. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it is. I've, I've asked about doing it before, and the response was not very enthusiastic. Why would that even be an issue? I'm, that, I'm curious, because it's your show, and it's like having any other guest, if you Well, will. it's a property of WGBH. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Yeah. So obviously you're in Boston. I know a couple of months ago, it was kind of the hotbed of COVID and I'm sure that affected your time on the air. What I read also is that you had only been off the air seven months out of your entire career. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. In 1977, I was unemployed for uh, seven months and I was going absolutely crazy. I told one uh, interviewer, I felt like an artist who had no canvas to paint on because mm. I had all these musical ideas going through my head and no way to express no them. No way to express them. Yeah. How sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that is the truth because this is your canvas. This is how you right. um, yes. communicate your love and reach out to people. And I know you have fans all over the world, or I should say listeners. So how has this shelter in place affected you, your ability to be on the air? Well, for several months, I wasn't on, on the air. I've had, besides the fact of my age, I've also had some uh, medical issues. And so pretty much the station told me to stay out of the station, um, which I certainly wasn't arguing the point. I, I knew what I thought their intentions were by doing that. So I didn't, that wasn't a problem, but I still, I got, did get antsy to get back on the air. And there definitely were people on Facebook who were writing saying, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? <laughs> you know? Um, but what GBH also has a 24, uh, seven jazz stream. And I, uh, what they had never done before, the jazz stream they have has no announcers. It just, just runs without announcers. They were trying to get it to work, the stream to work with a microphone. And uh, they have still never gotten it to work with the microphone. But I have been uh, programming on Thursday evenings um, with on live on the stream without the microphone. I've been doing that for a couple of months. I'm not sure if that's going to continue because there have been some changes at, at GBH and uh, a sort of reorganization of the music there at WGBH. And so I'm not sure uh, where we're going from here. I have to email my supervisor and ask him, what do we do now <laughs> at this point? So are you, are you referring to the, the live stream or are you talking about your future at WGBH? No, 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 no. The program director that we had for eight to 10 years resigned. Uh, yes, re retired rather, retired on June 30th. And so the station has now 
there's very little music left on WGBH. There is my show. There's a Celtic music music show that's on one day a week and the jazz stream. They have now merged all of them into something they're calling the music department. And the person who was the classical music program director is now heading that department. But this just happened within the last week. So right now things are a little muddy and I don't know if they want me to go back on the stream, even if there's no microphone or what they want me to do at this point. So for the listeners who don't understand what that means without a microphone, that means any back announcing or or pre-announcing, correct? Uh, Yes. I was using Facebook to announce each set on, uh, not, not announce, but list each set as I played the set. And that's because the stream was on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night during my regular shift during the pandemic time. It was airing on both the stream and on 89.7. So now if you went, if you listened on a phone or a computer and went to the, the stream is called Jazz 24-7. If you went to that uh, part of the GBH website, it would tell you what I was playing on your screen. Uh, But if you were listening on 89.7, there was no way for you to know what I was playing. That's why I was listing what I was playing on Facebook. Oh, I was wondering how, you know, I would see those posts from you and I wasn't quite sure what that was relating to. So do you feel that by everybody learning to adjust to this new way of programming that it may have a permanent effect as to how you do your show or um, is that something you're just not aware of yet moving forward? No, I I certainly hope that, uh, well, since I am back in the studio, I am using uh, the microphone in the studio. The using the stream without the microphone was something I did, but it's not something I really want to do. And it's, again, there are a number of listeners who said that they missed the uh, insights that I would share, share about the music, the stories that I could tell about the music or the musicians. So that's certainly the way I'd prefer to do things. And I don't see that, uh, I don't see that that's changing. That that station is going to change. That. Well, that's good to know because maybe we'll be revisiting you at your sixtieth anniversary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not because I may say, "Okay, that's enough." Some somewhere before there. <laughs> well, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about before I go more into how COVID has affected you and you know your your life in Boston, certainly in the music and in radio, but. Um, you have a very deep involvement with the John Coltrane Memorial Concert. And given all that's going on, I'm gathering that it will not happen this year. It's generally in the fall. As as far as I know, of, it's not even being planned. Since the mid-80s, it's been held on the campus of Northeastern University because one of the founders of the concert, uh, Leonard Brown, was uh, on the faculty there at Northeastern. Unfortunately, Leonard passed away last year. So they did have a concert last year, sort of in remembrance of him, but I'm not sure what the future of the concert is going to be. I know that Northeastern was still hoping that there was going to be a concert. And I think there are a lot of lovers of the music who were also hoping that there would be a concert, but um, I'm not really sure. I really didn't have anything to do with the planning of the concert, except that Leonard would sometimes come to me and ask me for advice. But for the most part, I was not involved in the actual planning of the concert. And, you know, although I have been associated with the concert, really, sometime Leonard and I couldn't even figure out when I started. Sometime in the late 80s, I began hosting the concert. And, you know, I felt in a lot of ways that uh, I didn't have a permanent gig. They had to ask me every year if they wanted me to host the concert. I didn't feel like, you know, I was an insider. I felt like everybody else, you know, uh, Leonard called me up every year saying, hoping you can do the Coltrane concert this year. I felt that that was tremendous because I'm a big Coltrane fan. So I really appreciated being part of that. But I think my name has 
became associated with it so much that uh, people linked the two of us together. Coincidentally, though, one of the other founders of the Coltrane concert was a man by the name of Hayes Burnett. He was also, besides being a bass player, he was also the overnight host at WGBH during the time that I was out of work. Oh, really? And, Interesting. Right. And I had been, uh, I hung out with him a few times and I said to him at one point, man, you got to let me fill in, man. I'm going nuts. You have to let me fill, <laughs> fill in when you, when you need a sub. Uh, so it's, as it turns out, the concert was in July. The first of uh, the concerts in July of 77. And in August, Hayes decided he was going on the road with either Sun Ra or Pharaoh Sanders. I can't remember wh- which. He actually worked with both of them. And uh, he asked me to fill in for him for two weeks. And I said yes, happily. And two weeks went by and nobody had heard from him. Three weeks went by, nobody had heard from him. Four weeks went by, nobody had heard from him. Five weeks went by, nobody had heard from him. After six weeks, he came back and he said, I don't want to do uh, the show anymore. I want to go play my bass. I I think that was pretty evident. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yes. Yes. And and a bit fortuitous for you as well. Right. Yes. Exactly. That I just sort of fell into the job. I was saying to someone the other day, I've never sent a resume to GBH. I never did any of that. I just sort of fell into the job. You know, it's like isn't that beautiful (laughs) when when that happens? No application. I never did any of that. You know. (laughs) Well, I ask you about the um, Coltrane Memorial Concert because as long as I've known you, that has been uh, a really important part of the work that you do and a real joy for you. And you know, my my hope is that like a lot of musicians are having to do right now um, is go online and it is possible. I mean, it's definitely uh, more production intensive, but it can happen. I I think one of the issues though, that Cheryl is that Leonard's son did the uh, prep work for the concert last year. And actually he lives in DC. Leonard, when he was there, not only did he, uh, as long as he was at the university, he retired actually a few years uh, before he passed away. But as long as he was at the university, Leonard could work at it. There was another professor who was involved with the concert for a while, too. And Leonard could get interns to help him uh, work on the concert. When uh, his son took over, he didn't have the kind of on-the-ground people mm, um, I see. working for him. So that I just think coordinating it all is a little bit more tricky for him from D.C., Oh yeah, it's even if he was in Boston, it's a big, you know, any undertaking like that, whether it's live or online, is huge. And when right. certainly when you're right. not in Boston proper, so well, my hope will be that it can continue for so many reasons, right. um, because how beautiful that it's, you know, it's in its in its forty third year, important to keep right, right, that right. music. Uh, the music of John Coltrane and the legacy alive and certainly your involvement with it. So speaking of I, North... Before, before you go on, I just want to mention uh-huh. that Leonard's son was the owner of the Bohemian Caverns in Washington, D.C. Re- what a rich legacy, really. Right, yes, yes. Uh-huh. And for you to be part of that, I just, I really hope that can continue for you and also for the listeners and to keep that alive within the Boston area and at Northeastern University. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me too. Me too. (laughs) And you're in the process of designing a curriculum to be able to continue teaching and you're going to be doing that online. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, And, you know, when they first said about uh, teaching online, my first thoughts were, okay, well, basically I'll do what I was doing and just do it online. But then you realize that, uh, first of all, Northeastern University, like most universities, has students from all over the world. So although my class usually met from 1145 to 120 on Mondays and Thursdays, well, it's not quite that simple because in Hong Kong, 1145 here is not 11.45 there. So even the preparation work now has to involve uh, more activities that the students can do 
without me physically being in their presence. Clarify how that worked prior to going online. If they're not physically here, how were they able to attend your class? Well, well they were the they were class. here before. I mean, you know. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, before, you know, you were rolled in, in the class and you came into the class and um, I did a normal class that used, uh, I used some uh, materials that were online and, you know, then there was my in-class presentation. But uh, now I probably will record some part of the presentation, which will be part of my presence in the classroom. But then there'll be some sort of uh, discussions that will have to take place uh, more online, maybe using video or text. You know, we, we I start a question and each student will be asked to uh, participate in the discussion. You know, what are your thoughts on such and such a thing? You know, why do you think John Coltrane is so important today? And each stu student would have to give their comments on that question. Now, as I say, again, that could be text or it could be a video of me asking the question. And then the students could reply the same way, either with a video response or with a text response. Test, a quiz, all of that has to be done online. That's what this time is kind of showing us is how to reinvent ourselves and reinvent ways of, of doing right. things. Right, yes, yes. Which could be um, actually a positive thing moving forward. And yet yes. we're very aware of um, the inadequacies of the availability of Wi-Fi and computers and, you know, a lot of things that we're right, dealing right. with domestically here right. with having equal opportunities for right. people to study from home. And you mentioned John Coltrane and, and you know, why it's important to keep the legacy alive. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were studying pre-med and you <laughs> heard Coltrane and said, Change direction, course correct. <laughs> Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? Sean? I w I was I was digging deep. Am I am I wrong? Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, you're right. You're one hundred percent right. I told you, had I known you were such a VIP <laughs> no, no, all these don't years, I would have had a little bit more respect for you, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I did uh hear Coltrane's music, and it totally uh, changed my life. I've even gone so far as, as to say, one, I grew up in the Christian church. I was an active member, very active member at a very young age in the church. But during the civil rights era, I became very disillusioned uh, with the church because of two incidents, really. One was not a personal incident, but one the other was. Uh, one was I just couldn't understand why every minister in the country wasn't speaking against racism and discrimination on the pulpit. Martin Luther King is saying, this is the number one problem in America today. And I'm hearing preachers who are preaching these nice sermons that aren't even addressing this issue. That just bothered me. I looked at what I knew of Jesus. I said, Jesus went in the temple and turned over the, the tables. tables. Yes. The, yes. Right. So I said, you know, so there's a time to be nice and peaceful, mm -hmm. but there's a time to get upset. And I just didn't see enough of them uh, that were upset. And then on a personal level, when I was a senior in high school, about eight of us took over my high, well, I'll use the word take over, uh, but I'll then explain it. It said that about eight of us, I'll, I'll do this. I'll say this. It said that about eight of us took over my high school and closed it for about a week. Now I'll explain what I said. They said we did. Actually, I, I was president of high school student government. There were the other seven were all elected or appointed officials of either previously elected or previously appointed officials of student government or the senior class. So my argument is we didn't take over anything. We're elected officials by the students of this class. We actually wrote up an eight-page petition. We uh, met with the Board of Education in a public meeting. In fact, uh, there were so many people, the, the chambers for the Board of Education were very small, and the board tried to keep it a closed meeting. And actually, the police came up and said, we think you better let people in. There are so many people downstairs outside of City Hall. We're afraid there could be a riot if you don't let people come into the meeting. So uh, people came in. Now, 
where I got disillusioned was there were people I knew in my church who I'd known all my life and uh, or certainly close to all my life. And many of them, I thought, were treating me like I was a mugger or that I had committed some sort of crime. And I just didn't see that I had done anything wrong. And I just didn't like, like the way these people were treating me. I just said, you know, I don't understand this in terms of the way I'm understanding Christianity, that they are reacting like this. I, I, I just don't see this together with my understanding of uh, what I had been taught Jesus was about. I just, I, you know, I had to think that with my understanding at that time, I said, well, you know, Jesus would have been walking down the street with Martin Luther King. Absolutely. And and yet that's happening now, Eric. Right. Yes, you know, it is. It I'm is. a Christian and I um, am incensed about things that are going on. And, and that's okay. You right. know what? Yeah, that well, is part of the yeah. message. And you're right. Jesus would be walking down the street and really preaching the sermon that more needs to be done as opposed to less. And I think it's interesting given the, that John Lewis just passed. Right, and, right. You know, one of the quotes that I think is so apropos to right now is, you know, never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble, right? Right, right. And yet maybe you can speak to this because it is so apropos to today about how divisive people are over making some good noise. Right, right, right. Well, I think I can't remember the exact quote that uh, President Carter said, but he I, even before all of this, he's talked about what he saw as the good Christian. And in many cases, there were just too many people that, uh, and the, which is the reason why he made the remarks uh, about, you know, uh, it was about hunger. It was about mistreatment of other people that his remarks were. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that um, there are certainly good people who are fighting the fight under the banner of their religion. But there are too many, as we know, the Ku Klux Klan holds up the cross, too. Mm -hmm. So there are too many who are hiding under a, a hood um, of one way or the other and opposing those things. Uh, I think that it led me to um, a period, a very brief period, where I uh, I was sort of flirting with the idea of atheism. It was like, there can't be a God if if all this is being allowed to be happening. And it was John Coltrane's music that touched me and had the power to bring tears to my eyes. And I couldn't describe them as tears of joy or tears of sadness, but I just know I would listened to Coltrane. In, in particular, one of the earliest recordings I listened to was his Love Supreme. And that just reawakened in me this uh, knowledge that, yes, th there definitely is a God out here. And I may not necessarily understand what is happening, but I know there's a God, and I'm not going in that direction. It was Coltrane and his music that awakened that in me. Well, it's hard not to listen to his music and his playing without being moved. Right. Um, and that is the beauty of music. Right. Yes. It amazes me sometimes when people can hear such a profound musician or look at a sunset or something that has such intrinsic beauty and not believe in something higher than us and uh, not allow man to take that away because every right, single right. day that's challenged. Yeah, so I'm curious yeah, yeah. how your, was it, expected or was there any kind of idea where all right you're going to study pre-med but now you've had a life-changing or life-altering experience was that received by your family um it, i i don't they didn't make a, a, a I, I didn't actually i never really actually studied music in in a formal sense and i actually left school during my second year and i've never gone back in a degree program so I was starting. I think you've done okay, Aaron. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I think you've done okay. And I wasn't really referring to studying music. I just meant that you knew that you had a different calling, that it wasn't going to be pre med, that somehow you wanted to be involved with playing this, you know, presenting this music and, and uh, you know, being involved with music somehow, well, some way. You know, sure. I have sort of a joke that I say while my class 
classmates were going off to uh, classes and preparing for their futures, I was sitting in the dormitory listening to music and preparing preparing <laughs> for my future. <laughs> 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 that would actually make it that would make a a, a great cartoon <laughs> uh, <laughs> the new yorker or something. Okay, yeah. um i was and if you had told me about this i wasn't aware and talk about bringing tears to your eyes because it brought up um the memory of someone very special and important to both of us that in 2012, you um, were awarded the Duke Dubois Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes, yes, yes. And that was I, I didn't wonderful. even know that was an award. And uh, for those who aren't aware of who Duke Dubois was, can you speak to that for a moment? Duke Dubois was a, what they call a promotion man, a promo person, which Cheryl also was a promo person at one time. Uh, <laughs> and basically... Those are the people that, uh, in the days that Duke was around, a lot of record companies had their own promo people. Nowadays, hardly any record company does. Most of that's all done by independents. But they're the people that make sure that records get into the hands of announcers and maybe press people too. And um, they then do some sort of follow-up to see what you think about the record and uh, uh, whether you're going to play the record. And, and in some cases, you have a relationship with those people over so long that they'll actually say to you, I'm not sure if this is going to work for you or not, but uh, I wanted to bring it to your attention. And Duke also had a habit. He would just say that he was, uh, tell me that he was calling about a record that he had, didn't have any links to, except that the person was a friend. And he wanted to help out the friend and make sure that we knew about the record and, uh, you know, bring it to our attention. Because sometimes, and it's even worse now, Cheryl, than when you were in the business, we get so much music now, I say, without the promo people, it would be very difficult. And you get so much music even by people who you've never heard before. You don't know anybody on the CD and you don't know any of the songs. And for those people, the person who does a promo job is a lifesaver. Because they tell you, well, Eric, this is something that uh, I think you might be interested in. Because if you've got 30, 40 records like that, why am I going to listen to your CD as opposed to somebody else's CD that fits that same description? So the promo person would sort of guide you around. Duke, Duke worked with a number of artists in uh, making suggestions about uh, recordings. I mean, you know, he was just a great guy. I, I was thinking the other day, and I don't even know why this came up. One year, I was in New York at one of the conferences, and there was another announcer from WGBH who had never been to a conference. And... We walked into a restaurant to get something to eat. And when we got into the restaurant, Duke was in the restaurant. He came over and spoke to us and talked with us for a while. And then he left. And when it was time for us to go, you know, I called the waiter over and asked for the check. And the waiter said, oh, he paid your bill already. It's like, what? Really? Really? That, that's <laughs> Duke. Never... That, that was right. Duke. What a, yeah. uh, he was a beautiful human being. And I didn't know there was a Lifetime Achievement Award um, in his honor. So who actually presents that? There is a trade publication, which was a print publication at one time. Now it's just online, called Jazz Week. And they actually publish a listing of airplay on jazz radio uh, stations and programs across the country. By Wednesday of each week, I have to call in with a report of what I'm playing and how much I'm playing that. And they compile all that data and have a listing of, I don't, I don't even know how many it is, maybe it's top 50 recordings receiving airplay on jazz radio across the country. And shortly after Duke died, they started that. Well, actually, I don't remember how much time passed. They started that award. Now, the only way you get into that is the people who are already winners of the award vote on who the next person is who gets into that group. So it's a, it's a relatively small group of people even now. We just finished the voting the other day for this year's winners, which I won't announce. Oh, come on, Eric. Give us a peek inside. <laughs> actually, 2020 was actually the year my show got cut back from full-time to part-time. 
And my first reaction was, oh, this is a sympathy vote, you know, because they got my show back. And, they, and I was told, no, the voting for this actually happened several months ago. So, no, this is not a sympathy vote. You got voted in. And then the station cuts back your hours. But uh, you were already selected uh, in the group. It's mostly announcers, but it also uh, promotional people are in. And there have been a couple uh, record label owners like um, Joe Fields, who owned uh, High Note and Savant, and at one time, Muse Records was a member before he passed away. So it's a small group of people, and we don't do much of anything other than you get this presentation that recognizes the work that you do for the music and for the jazz community. Well, I think Duke would be very pleased to know that you are the recipient of this award. Um, and I know that in 2017, your show, Eric in the Evening, in case we haven't mentioned that, also received Jazz Week's Best Terrestrial Station? Yes. Terrestrial means a radio station on your FM dial, in this case. Non-terrestrial is, is satellite or internet. That's what that means. I've, I've also won several other awards from Jazz Week, too. I won Best Programmer, I think, two or three times over the years. Well, Eric, if I sat here and named everything that you've won, we'd be on for three hours. But <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you one of the things I'm really proud of? that I Absolutely. Did? Around uh, the beginning of the century, Mass College of Art, Massachusetts College of Art, selected me as one of the 100 most culturally influential Bostonians of the 20th century. And I just thought, wow. That's a big deal. <laughs> that is the big deal. That is quite right. the honor yeah. because, sure. you know, what is the jury that, that chooses that other than the fact that you have a 50-year legacy within Boston? And plus, you know, there are a lot of people who think of Boston as a, this big cultural center. And to get that in a place that a lot of people think of as this hub of culture, to me, was pretty special. I was, really? Me? It's very special, <laughs> something to be really, really proud of. And I want to ask you, because we're, I can't even believe that we're almost at an hour. I mean, now, you know, Cheryl, you and I can talk. We can talk, we can dish it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm really, I'm so fascinated. You can know someone for, you know, I think we've known each other for 38 years, and yet who thinks to ask certain, it's like what you said about your father, hearing right, stories right. that you had never heard yeah, before, yeah, and yet yeah. he's your dad. But tell me how you came to be chosen as a curator for the American Museum of Jazz in Kansas City. Well, again, it goes back to Leonard Brown. Leonard Brown was named as the, I can't remember the official title, but basically he was the historian on the project. And uh, when he, he approached me about selecting the music for the museum, their listening stations, and he approached me about selecting the music. Well, when he came to me, I said, oh, talk to Phil Schapp, um, who is, of course, a well-known historian, has done a lot of restoration projects on uh, recordings, has been on the air in, in New York for years. But for some reason, uh, he and Leonard didn't click. I have, I have no idea why. And Leonard came back to me and said, man, I want you to do it. So it was an interesting project because I had to select music and then I had to deal with the whole rights thing. And we had problems, for example, uh, with Max Roach. I heard that he was an early supporter of the museum and then he had, had some disagreement with the uh, person who was in charge of setting up the museum. And so when I started suggesting music, Max was turning down everything. I was even told at one point, well, maybe we can't include Max in the museum. And I said, that's, you know, how can you not? You can't, yeah. Have not how Max? can you do that? So I selected, oh, I can't remember the tune, but it was a Bud Powell tune where Max has a pretty prominent drum part. That was a way we could get Max represented in the music, uh, in the museum rather, was by, you know, using somebody else's music with him featured on it. Leonard also sponsored conferences on Charlie Parker there at the museum that I spoke at. Um, the first one was very large and very intimidating because Max was there, Mill Jackson was there, Al Gray was there, Billy Taylor was there, Clara Bryant. There were loads of musicians there. 
and I'm supposed to speak. And I'm like, wow, really? You know, you look and see who's there. It's like, what? <laughs> even even <laughs> you time. can be intimidated at times. Right? Well, another time I got asked to speak in Providence and uh, on the history of jazz and James Moody sitting in the first row. It's like, what? No pressure. You know? <laughs> Right. Yes. I think that's exactly what I said. No pressure. Don't leave James Moody sitting here. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, you know, and most of the thing, a lot of the big things that I participated in, I thought were uh, learning experiences, you know, and I, that's certainly working on the museum required me to do a lot of digging, you know, studying history and research and listening to music. So I certainly, I did get paid, but part of the reward was just finding out that much more about the music of Kansas City, the city itself uh, in that particular time period. That was certainly a reward right there, you know, to be able to uh, learn all that much more about the uh, music, how Kansas City fit into the overall scheme of jazz history in particular. So uh, that was uh, very exciting to uh, to do. Now, did you also spend time in the city and um, get to be part of the ribbon cutting? I was there. I was there for the opening day. I remember meeting, I don't think Pat was there, but I remember meeting Pat's, Pat Matheny's mother and father. And his brother Mike had lived here in Boston, so I knew his brother Mike. And he introduced me to Pat's mother and father. They, they are from Missouri. And so I was introduced to them. I met a, a lot of very interesting people uh, while I was there. I didn't actually. I wasn't a participant in the ceremony. It's been a year since I've been there, but I've been to the museum three times for the opening and for these two Charlie Parker conferences that were there. I love to go back and I always wanted my parents to go and they never were able to get out there. You know, the funny story is too, that my voice is in one exhibit. And it's actually something I'm not really happy about because I didn't think about it, but they have me speaking in the first person. And it's like, well, I didn't really want to speak in the first person. I was demonstrating something or doing something, you know. It's like I shouldn't have been speaking in the first person. What a beautiful legacy to be part of. Um, Now, So these are permanent installations, right? These are not something that are changed out. This is part of the Uh, As far as I know, they are still there. I met someone from the museum at a conference in January of this year. And uh, as far as I know of, the musical selections I made are still there. They've changed the way you listen to them, but the selections, I think, are still there. So, Eric, getting back to kind of the where we're at right now and certainly what your city has gone through, uh, what our nation is going through, do you have any fears or concerns regarding the pandemic? And if so, what are they? You know, I certainly see that everything has changed. And there is certainly a new way of doing everything now. And that may be permanent, but it may be that our whole American lifestyle has changed and it may never get back to being the way it was. So that would be a concern that I have for not not just the Boston area, but for America, the interactions between people in a time when computers and phones were already taking away from our interactions. We're interacting even less at this point. So I think that's that's the major concern mm-hmm. that I have. I mean, you know, I, obviously I'm not in this area, but how do you date? How, you know, I mean, how do you meet someone in these circumstances? And then after you've met them, what do you do? You know, I mean, just think about that. Just the simple thing of first even meet them and then how do you continue a relationship with them? You can't say, uh, let's go to the club and hear the such and such a band. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a concert this weekend. You want to go to concert with me? Well, as someone who didn't get married till they were 46, I can tell you that problem has existed long before <laughs> this time. But I, I, I really do hear what you're saying. I mean, it's interesting that that is an example you brought up because you're married, you have children, and we tend to not think of the things that don't affect us. And um, because there are some really positive things that are coming out of this time. And yet, you know, the one to one interaction. And yes, we've all done our Zoom dinners or happy hours or I even was listening to a, a podcast earlier today of someone who did their, you know, their Seder online. And yeah, um yeah. 
And so there are ways to still connect. And in some ways, you know, it's forced people to slow down. And, you know, if you sit in front of a screen, at least you're getting in front of someone and communicating. But like you say, to think of what does it mean to be a single person um, and trying to meet someone right. and trying to, for, because we all know being in person is a very different chemistry than it is sure, um, sure, being sure. on the phone or being online. So what, what skill sets, if you will, have you learned to kind of combat any of the fears or your concerns in moving forward? Well, I think, I, I think in some ways I still have a lot of fears in, in part for me personally, because of my uh, pre-existing health problems, you know, I'm afraid to do almost anything. And for certainly for my relatives, because younger folks, and I guess it just is for younger folks in general, you know, they they tend to think they're invincible. To anything, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so then I'm concerned that they'll do something without thinking and it will lead to bad consequences for them. And even as, as a lot of people said, even if these young people think they're invincible, you've got a grandfather, you've got a grandmother, you've got some older person and you could take it to them even. So we are connected whether we like it or not. And so I'm concerned again, how this is changing our whole American lifestyle. And I'm not seeing my way to getting back to what the old normal was. You know, I, when I first started thinking about teaching online, I'm thinking like, wow, you know, you, you can't really interact in the same way as you could when the student was sitting right next to you. You know, I mean, even if, even if it's not related to learning activities, you just can't, you know, come to class early and talk, talk to the person sitting next to you and say, what'd you do this weekend? Right, or how are you doing? And just checking in. You know, <laughs> right, yeah. And I just think that uh, the impact this is having on our society right now and for the future is, uh, but now we can just see it's just, you know, everybody's saying it's temporary and maybe, but w what will the uh, outcome be after all of this COVID seems to have calmed down? How will we be on the other side of all of that? I'm very concerned about how that will be, you know, I can only go forth with faith. I remember a friend of mine saying after he heard of a certain political uh, candidate being elected, he said, I'm not worried. God is still in charge. Mm. And that's what we, that, <laughs> that, you know, that's what we forget. Right. And it's, you know, you touched on it earlier. It's like, you know, how could a loving God, and, and I question that too, how can a loving God allow such and such to happen or a certain person to be you know, have the power that they have. And yet we have to remember the end of the story, right? Right, right. Yes, yes, <laughs> um, yes. So is that what makes you hopeful? What, what oh, does definitely. bring you no hope? doubt, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. I okay. definitely, I definitely, I, I remember I had a friend who told me she was uh, depressed. And I told her, you know, I look outside and some days I see stormy days and it's all dark and gray and maybe branches are falling down on the trees. And the next day I look up and the sun is shining bright. Mm. You know, it's a beautiful day outside. So there are storms, but I have faith that the storms will pass. Amen. That is, that is yeah. beautiful because that's really life, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and it's also perspective. So, um, I think you just answered that, but I was going to ask you, what brings you joy in the midst of the storms then? Is it the hope oh, for the sunshine? Is it hope for listening to your favorite piece of music? What does bring you joy? Listening to music certainly does, especially when I take the time to listen to some of my favorites. You know, I listen to a lot of music and uh, sort of as part of the job. And sometimes I think, you know, that's okay. But I, I still love listening to Miles. I still love listening to Train. You know, there's some favorites, and that certainly brings me joy listening to them. Talking to, even if it's got to be remotely, I enjoy talking to friends, you know, laughing with friends. I enjoy seeing my family. Four of my five grandkids came by the other day, 
they all wore their mask when they came near mm. me. You know, even the six-year-old knew to put his mask on when he came near me. You know, <laughs> I was in the back of the house and they were all up in the front of the house. But when he had to come through the back, to the back of the house, he put his mask on. It's, it's great. It's great to see them growing up. I have two twin granddaughters who will turn 12 um, Friday. And so, you know, I mean, it's great seeing that life is continuing. And they certainly uh, bring me joy to see them and watch them grow. And, um, you know, uh, you know, they drive me nut, nut, little nuts with all the noise they make. But, uh, you know. <laughs> but what a, what a joyful noise. Right, there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, so, uh, is there something that you reading? I also uh, enjoy reading too. I, enjoy, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I enjoy, also enjoy reading. Is there any particular book you're reading lately that you want to share with us? First of all, I read a lot of books on music, and uh, I enjoy reading books like that. And I, you know, because because I think the music uh, has a place in time. And I enjoy it. So it's not only in a lot of ways reading about music, but it's reading about, which is what my course tries to deal with. It tries to say this music existed, it was at its peak of popularity at this particular time in America. And there were forces that caused this music to come up. There were forces that made this music survive. There were certain activities that went along with this music. That's all things that I find fascinating to learn and to teach about. And that's so important, isn't that, to know the context of how a piece of art was, or when a piece of art was created, Um because right, it puts right. it in context. And if you just aren't familiar with that time frame and what the musicians were going through culturally, what was happening, it, there may not be the depth of understanding as to how, you know, why so passionate or why so sensitive and beautiful or why so angry. Yeah, I think all of that comes to play. I'm reaching for them. The book, uh, the other book I'm reading, I'm reading a book called The Reality of Our Sacred Human Nature, Our Origins and Our Destiny. That's a book I'm reading right now, too. It's by Fahim Shuaib. I think he's uh, an imam of a, a mosque in Los Angeles. That in and of itself, the title is a, something to chew on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, is there something you'd like to tell people that I haven't asked you about? Something you want to leave them with? Well, I would just say uh, probably that, you know, I got into radio never thinking that it was going to be my career. I got into radio because there was an ad in the campus paper at BU, and they said they would train, no experience necessary. And I got into it thinking, oh, this would be fun to do while I'm in college. And I'd say 51 years later, I'm still having big fun. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I know that people are enjoying you being on the air presenting the music. And that is a huge, huge statement in and of itself to be on the air 51 years, considering how much the different mediums have changed in the way that music is presented and how people access it. And I wish you great health and continued longevity at WGBU. Same to you, Cheryl. Same to you. Thank you, yeah. Eric. And we'll just look forward to the next incarnation of what this means for you and for your teaching. And I just thank you for your time. My pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Cheryl. All right, Eric. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Bye now. Bye-bye. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips in so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song, Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23:18. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. 
I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.